All right, so I'm hoping now that all of you are able to see my Research 101 and eLibrary USA screen. Somebody wants to give me a thumbs up or just say you can see it in the chat, I would appreciate it. Just to make sure you're seeing what I want you to see. Yes, I see it. Thank you, Henry. And oh, everybody else too. Thank you so much. All right. Well, like I say, um, today we are going to be talking about uh, just a, a little bit of an overview of how to do research. And then we're going to go into a tool that I hope you'll find useful. So let's see. All right. So I am going to admit that when I was a student, both undergraduate, high school, and even graduate school, I didn't really enjoy doing research. I thought of it as just work. And of course, I didn't really want to do work. Um, but what I've actually figured out is if you're doing research on something that is meaningful to you, it actually can become quite exciting um, as you seek to learn new things. And I loved this quote, um, research is to see what everybody has seen and to think what nobody has thought. I think that makes it a much more exciting prospect rather than just thinking of it as oh, a paper or a presentation that I have to give. Um, if you get excited about doing the research, um, I think you'll enjoy it much, much more. So, why are research skills so important to students? And I'm actually gonna broaden that and say it's even important to, to students and um, in your career. And the first thing is that this is actually US research that a lot of high school and university students, um, they're often citing resources that are not scholarly. Um, they might be opinion or biased um, maybe they're using social uh, resources that they found on social media. And, you know, to be really factual, to be good research, you want to be using those scholarly sources and making sure that what you're using is authoritative. So that's some of what we're going to cover in the second half of this presentation. The other thing I want to point out is the ability to communicate whether it is in writing, whether it's giving a speech, whether it's talking one-on-one, -on -one, this is a skill that is so important to success in any line of work. Whatever you're going to do, if you can communicate in writing um, and communicate um, your arguments and be persuasive, you're gonna have a much more successful career. So just a couple good reasons why I think um, being a good researcher is going to help you. So, sorry about that. So the first half of this presentation, I'm gonna take you to, through the five steps of good research. And these are not my five steps. These are what academic um, writing services, um, university uh, writing programs will tell you are the five good steps to research, all right? There we go. Um, so oftentimes just starting your research can be the most daunting task. Um, maybe you don't know where to start. And that's why these five steps are really useful. If you follow these, I promise you, it will take some of the pressure off of your conducting your research because it will walk you through the steps. Um, which again can sometimes be the hardest part is just getting started. So first of all, we're gonna st start with step number one, which is deciding on your topic and defining it. So when we talk about um, topics and, and what it is we wanna accomplish, the first thing we might wanna do is think about what, what is the end product? Are we writing report, an essay? Are we going to be giving a speech or doing debate? As you think about the topic that you want to cover, what are the key words? Um, as a librarian, I'm interested in why people believe conspiracy theories that they see online or 
why maybe they fall prey to misinformation that they see in social media. So I might be thinking of terms around things like misinformation, media literacy, um, like I say, social media. Mm -hmm. So coming up with keywords, I'm going to be using those keywords later when I'm looking for information, when I'm typing them into my databases. Think about what you already know about a topic. Now, maybe you think, oh yeah, I, I know that it's in my head. But the fact is, write it down. Write down the pieces of your research that you already know. You know, for me um, and my topic, maybe I already know that social media has amplified misinformation, um, that a large percentage of Americans believe the misinformation that they see online. So maybe these are things I already know, but what I need to find out is why do they believe the things that they do? So that's the next thing I wanna write down is what do I need to find out? One of the, one of the ways that you can uh, help yourself is by creating two or three what I call focus questions. Focus questions are questions that you want to answer in your writing, in your speech, in your presentation. What are the three things that you want to answer? So again, for my uh, example, it might be, why do people believe conspiracy theories? Or how common is it that people uh, check the uh, authority of the information that they see in social media posts. You know, if I pick two or three answers, two or three questions that I want the answer to, by the end of my research, I should be able to answer those questions. All right. So here's a question for you. Um, where do you typically look for information? And I welcome you to put it in the chat if you're willing to. Give you um, a couple seconds to put in the chat. Where do you typically start looking for information when you are doing a research, uh, maybe for work? Maybe, okay, I'm seeing some answers. Google, 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 Sci-Hub. All right, uh, access Google PubMed, excellent. All right, Google Scholar, that's a great answer. Okay, so Facebook, yep. Yeah. The fact is we know that we should be looking at scholarly um, sources, things like library books or academic journals. But the fact is that most of us, including me, we usually go online first. It's so easy. Right, we all have, you know, a phone. We can start doing our, our search on Google, you know, when we're riding on the bus, when we're sitting at the, at the coffee shop. And so that's what we all do, and that's fine. Google and the internet are great sources of information. It's just that you have to be able to recognize what is authoritative and maybe what is fact and opinion or not so authoritative. So Starting online is a great idea. It might um, help you create those focus questions, find those keywords. Um, but at some point, you want to back up some of the information you're finding online with more authoritative sources. And that's where these databases I'm gonna talk about later on might help you out. All right, so step three. Okay, we've already defined our topic created our questions. We've started finding information by using those resources like um, Google, or maybe we've gone to the library. But now what are we going to do with that? So step three is select and record. So here's where we start evaluating the information that we found online, oftentimes on Google. We want to look at things like who wrote it? Are they an authority on the topic? Is the information up to date? Sometimes information that is 10 years old is perfectly fine. You know, if we're talking about something, um, you know, maybe history, uh, something that's old is just fine.
But if we're talking about something very modern, like the effects of climate change, we wouldn't want to cite a piece of research that was 10 years old because you know, things have changed so much in the research on climate change just in the past years, 10 years. We wanna look for something that maybe was published in the last year or last six months. So think about whether your information needs to be very current or if it's okay to be a little bit older. Um, next is recognizing whether things are fact and opinion. Um, opinions are fine. Um, they're quite useful actually in helping us think about our research, but when we're writing a scholarly paper or doing research, we mostly wanna be citing factual information, okay? So being able to recognize when something is fact, opinion, or biased information. Then the last thing is when you're selecting the information to use is you have to determine whether something is really relevant to your argument. Remember those focus questions you created in the first step? Well, if the information you have doesn't answer one of those questions, maybe you shouldn't be using it in your, in your research or in your presentation. So here's another question for you. How many searches does Google process every day? This is just give a wild guess. Anybody wanna guess how many Google searches, how many people go in and type in a search? Ooh, 3 billion. Very good, trillions. All right, anybody else have a guess? Billions, trillions, okay. So according to Google, they process about three and a half billion searches every day. That is 40,000 searches every second. Now, that's interesting. It's an interesting fact. But just because I was talking about Google and the fact that that's where a lot of us start our searches, this piece of information about Google searches, oh, three and a half billion, doesn't actually um, help my argument or the presentation I'm giving you. It's not really relevant. So I put this in here as an example of what not to do. Sometimes you find a really interesting piece of information, but it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't quite further your argument. So maybe you should leave it out. The other part of step three is the record part, okay? And when I say record, this means taking the information that you found, again, whether it's from library books or Google or anywhere else, and you're gonna start taking notes, okay? To summarize the information in your own words. And that's the really important part of this. When you're writing a paper or an essay, preparing a speech, you want it to, you want to include you in that. And that means what you think about a topic, okay? Not just exactly what somebody else wrote. So start putting things in your own words. That also shows that you really understand the content. Step four is we're actually gonna start organizing our research. Again, we've got those questions. Now we're gonna start putting all of that information we found in a logical sequence that helps further our argument. And while you're doing this, while you're laying out your argument, maybe you're physically taking pieces of paper and moving them around on a desk, you can start seeing if you have enough information to answer those questions. You also, can start seeing, oh, maybe I have too much information. Um, this is often a problem for me when I'm doing presentations. I often find so much information and maybe I've only got 15 minutes to present, but I have 30 minutes of material. So I need to start deciding what am I going to leave out? I can't include it all. So what 
what can I leave out that I can still support, you know, answering my questions, convincing you, my audience of what I'm trying to say, but maybe not taking so much time to do it. Okay. So that's organizing yourself. And then the last step is presenting, you know, deciding again, what pieces of information and how are you going to share them? You know, again, looking back and when you look at your presentation or read your essay, is it logical? Is it organized? Um, are you including images or infographics? Um, you know, in English, we like to say uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So sometimes when you're doing your research, you can find that picture or a graph or an infographic that really makes your point without saying a lot of words. And I encourage you to use images because just like in this presentation, if all I was, if all I had were words, um, it might get really boring looking at my slides. So by including pictures, by including graphs, um, hopefully I'm keeping the, the viewer's interest or the reader's interest. Um, and again, lastly, when you're thinking about how you present your information, are you including a little bit of your own opinions? You know, what do you think about the topic you chose? Um, even though it might be a research paper, it is your piece of work. And so again, you and what you think is important to include. And you wanna do that in your own words. So that's why we say no parroting, no just copying and pasting what someone else said. We wanna know your opinion, all right? And as I mentioned, I like to add a, a sixth step and that's evaluating your work. Um, whether you're in high school or college, whether you're already working, um, this is not the last piece of research or presentation or essay that you're gonna write. So going back and looking at how things turned out can really help you improve for the next time you have to present, have to uh, maybe create a presentation or write a research paper. So you wanna look at things like, you know, how did I do in defining my topic? Did, you know, did the person grading the paper, um, you know, maybe they said, oh, I didn't really know what you were trying to do or maybe you spent too much time locating and selecting information. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, I, I have a question there about getting the, the materials related to this session. After this session, um, somebody from the American um, Center is going to send um, all of my slides um, to all of you. So I should have said at the, at the very beginning, um, so you don't need to be worrying about taking too many notes um, because all of these are going to be sent to you. So just listen for now. How about that? Um, so again, when you're evaluating your own work, um, you know, how did you do? How, again, did you spend too much time on certain things? And then at the end, you had to rush through um, producing the final product. Um, you know, these are just ways to help you for the next time you do research. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about where to find the right information. So we've outlined these steps to research, but now we want to talk about, again, where are the good sources of information that you should be using for your research? Now, as we already talked about, a lot of us, including me, I use Google literally every day whether I am looking for an address to a restaurant I wanna to go to, um, maybe I'm looking up the instructions for how to make an egg coffee, um, maybe I'm going online to uh, book an airline ticket. We all use Google just about every day. Um, I can't imagine going back to um, the old way things were done um, when we didn't have Google, right? But again, we just need to recognize that sometimes the information we find may not be 
exactly the information we want to use in our research. And what we want to do is often we want to take that information that we found online and verify it by using other sources. So sometimes we can do that all online. We can, you know, look for authorities that are writing on our topic and make sure, okay, I see, you know, three professors of, um, let's say, uh, computer science have all written the same thing. Um, so I'm pretty sure, you know, these are authoritative sources, but sometimes you can't find that kind of, um, you know, that kind of confirmation. So using academic databases can be really helpful. Academic based databases are those that major universities in the US and around the world purchase. They have to pay to have access to these. And the reason they have to pay for them is because the creators of these databases are vouching for the quality of the information. They're doing all of that background to make sure that only the best research from only the most authoritative sources are getting into these databases. And so that's why you can trust them. And of course, because they want to sell these products to lots of universities, their reputation depends on these resources being really high quality. And so we know, you know, particularly librarians, we are constantly um, evaluating what is the best um, databases for our audiences. And so what I'm gonna share with you is some of the best that we think um, we can share with you from the American spaces. So this is what the eLibrary USA homepage will look like when you go there. Um, you'll see it's a, sh it's a fairly short list of resources that I'm gonna go over with you right now. Um, the URL of course is right there. It's elibraryusa.state.gov. What is eLibrary USA? Again, it's, it's what we call a digital or an e-library, meaning that everything is online. I think I mentioned this already. These are the databases that a lot of major universities are going to be providing to their students. Um, in addition to these academic databases, we have newspapers, magazines, videos, dissertations. These are all materials that can be helpful for both teachers, um, professors, students, um, high school students. The content of eLibrary USA, I will tell you, is all in English. So just be prepared for that. Um, there are international newspapers um, that I'm gonna show you, but again, most of the content is going to be in English. Many of the databases do have an ability to auto-translate to Vietnamese, but of course we all know that auto-translate isn't always the best, so just be warned. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and again, one of the important things about these databases is it's always being updated. So you don't have to worry that what you're looking at is going to be, oh, this is information that is old and out of date. You're always going to see exactly when the information was published. So that can be helpful. And again, um, this is something that's brought to you by the American Spaces here in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. But we are also providing access for you at home right now because of COVID with the American centers closed, we want you to still be able to use these resources. And so I know that um, most of you have already received these login, the login and password, but here it is again. Again, these materials will send you afterwards. Um, I do wanna stress that this is a temporary access at home. Um, I expect that we'll have this access for a while 
But when things finally get back to normal and our American centers are able to open, um, you will need to come in to use Amer the, the eLibrary USA. So use it a lot right now um, while you have access it from have while you have access to it from home or your office. <clears throat> so again, here's what the, the homepage looks like. And we're going to start right at the top with news and magazines. This first resource is called Press Reader. And it is a database of about 600 international newspapers and magazines. So when you might wanna use newspapers for doing your research is when you're looking for very current events. You know, if you wanna talk about, um, you know, let's think of an example here. Well, I'll, how about this example? Um, the UEFA championship, you know, this just happened, what, a day ago? And so obviously, if you were to look at research databases, there's not going to be anything there. But newspapers give you a snapshot into what's happening around the world, practically in real time. Um, you can see on the left hand of the screen here, that you can also go back and look at older versions of newspapers. Um, so if you're interested in, say, something that was happen, happening in Washington, D.C. Um, a month ago, you could go online and look at the Washington Post from a month ago. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is this is exactly what you're going to see when you go into this database. It looks exactly like the newspaper as it was printed on paper. So you're gonna see the ads, you're gonna see it colors and photographs and everything else. So, um, you know, it's, it's literally like, like having the newspaper in front of you. Okay, so I have another question. Um, what's needed for a person that comes into the AC for the first time? Is it only an ID? So that is a great question. Um, when you come to the American Center, when they're open, you will need to bring an ID. If you're a student, you need to bring your student ID, preferably if you have a national ID, that makes it even easier. So do bring either a student ID or a national ID when you want to come to the American Center, okay? All right, and yes, that's all you need. You only need an ID, okay? If you have any questions, please write to the American Center. Um, I'll have one of my staff members put that email address in the chat box. And you can always ask any questions about getting into the American Center that way. All right. OK. Next, I want to talk about magazines on Flipster. So press reader, magazines and newspapers. Flipster is just magazines. And this is a small group of magazines that the Office of American Spaces has chosen for you, our audience. And it is everything from current events um, to technology, things like PC World and photography. It is music and sports. It is foreign policy and environment. Um, there's lots of different resources. And one of the ones I want to point out to you is any of the ones that are marked cricket are meant for English language learners. So if you or someone in your family or friends are learning English, or if you are an English teacher, um, check out the cricket titles because they have activities um, specifically for in the classroom or to do at home that are gonna help you with learning English. Okay, and again, just like the newspaper database, um, what you would see in a magazine is exactly what you are gonna see when you click on one of these magazines. So a picture um, of a Rolling Stone page on the left, um, Time Magazine on the right. Again, you're gonna see all the ads, you're going to see the photographs, you're going to see the layout, just as it was as if you were holding the magazine in your hands, okay? All right, 
so I've got a question about um, when will the American Center open again? That's a, a really good question. And of course, we have to follow a lot of the same rules as everyone else in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. So until, um, you know, until we are able to open safely because of COVID, um, what I would recommend is follow us on Facebook or Instagram. And of course, as soon as we know we're going to reopen, we'll be announcing it there, okay? Uh, yes, and there, there it is, hanoiac at state.gov. If you have any questions about how to come to the American Center or any of the services that we offer, please feel free to write there. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to a couple resources that are meant for high school students, middle school and high school students. Um, these resources, um, Gale in Context Middle School and Opposing Viewpoints are really for, they're really like um, encyclopedia type information. So not quite the level of research that you would want if you're a university student, a graduate student, or a researcher. Um, but these are, are better, like I say, for maybe a high school audience. It's going to be factual information, just like you'd find in an encyclopedia. Um, and the opposing viewpoints is particularly good if you are interested in debate, because this resource is going to give you not only factual information, but it's going to give you some opinion as well. And it's going to give you opinions on both sides of an argument. So let's say you were in a debate club debating whether social media is good for children. Um, you could go into opposing viewpoints and find arguments that say, oh yeah, it's, it's really good for, for young people this because of this. And then you'd also find viewpoints that say, oh, you know, maybe it's not so good for kids because of this. So a, a good resource if you're, um, if you're interested in debate. Okay. All right, I see lots of comments coming in. They're going by fast. So hopefully um, Hung is going to be able to answer them or I will answer them at the end of the presentation. The last thing that I uh, want to focus on on this screen is something called book flicks. Now, as you can see by the image right now, this is, this is for children. Um, it is for beginning readers. But what we found is that a lot of people who um, are you know, trying to learn English, um, maybe they want to learn new vocabulary or improve their pronunciation, they actually really like using um, beginner books. They're short, um, they're easy to understand. And so this is a, a resource that's really good. It might be good for your little brother or sister who um, is learning, just learning English. It's also really good for adults who are trying to improve their English. The resource is both um, short videos that you'll listen to and have narration and um, subtitles so you can be following along. It's also short books on the same topic. Um, they can be read out loud. You can read along to them. Um, and it's just a really good way, again, to learn new, vo learn new vocabulary and you know, hear a native speaker making the pronunciations, okay? So just wanted to, to highlight that. Um, the last thing before I get back to academic resources is I wanted to let you know that we also have videos. These are the Canopy resources. The Canopy videos, there's probably about 150 of them now that you'll have access to. These are mainly documentary films. There are some popular movies, but they're mainly um, documentaries that you probably wouldn't see in the movie theaters. Um, you're mostly not gonna see them on Netflix or other places um, similar to that. Um, but they're on all sorts of topics. They're on social issues, they're on sports, um, LGBT, um, music. 
there's just lots of, of good background information. There are also some that are kind of how-to videos um, by lecturers at US universities who are gonna talk about things like, you know, how to do, uh, how to be a good public speaker or how to um, communicate well in writing. So do take a look at some of these videos. I think um, I, I often look at them and think, oh, that's one that I wanna actually join I, or I wanna actually watch because they're some really interesting documentaries that you wouldn't see other places. All right. So I know I've been talking for a while, but I just wanna, I do wanna finish up with the getting back to the academic and research databases because that's what we started talking about. All right. And again, these are going to be for, you know, if you're in university, if you are a graduate student, if you are thinking about studying in the United States, these are a really good resource because every student in the United States, every university is going to be using these databases. Um, and so if you have experience using them before you start studying overseas, um, it'll really give you a leg up. All right. So there are three of these databases. The first two are very similar. Academic, Gale Academic OneFile and JSTOR are databases of academic journal articles. So these are what we call peer reviewed. And again, that means that experts in that field have read these articles and agree that, ooh, this is really well done, a really well done paper, really well done research, and it meets our academic standards to be in a prestigious academic journal. Okay, so by using these resources, we know that we're getting really the, the top quality. Okay, the other one, um, ProQuest dissertations and theses are exactly that. Um, they are the dissertations and theses that students have to write if they are working on their master's degree or even their doctoral degree. These are, you know, a, it's a database of all the theses from over 700 universities in the US and other um, mainly English um, universities. Um, so again, if you are interested in a certain, um, you know, uh, area of research, um, maybe you're trying to decide what field of study you wanna go into, this could be a useful place for you to go and see what kind of research is being done in my field? What kind of theses have already been written? Okay. Um, I see a question about whether the documentary films in Canopy have subtitles. And I want to say yes, and I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive answer for that, but I believe that they mostly do have subtitles. Anybody um, wants to check for me, um, but I'm pretty sure that most of them will have subtitles. Some of them probably are even in additional languages besides English, but you'd have to look at each title to be sure. Okay, all right. So again, I'm just going to demonstrate Gale because um, all of these databases work very similarly, okay? Um, the first thing I want you to know is just like Google, all of these databases, you can just type in words as if you were typing in a, a Google search. Now, sometimes you're going to want to be, uh, use a more advanced search. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. This is when you want to, sorry. Oh, thank you so much. I have confirmation that the Canopy movies, the documentaries do have subtitles. So thank you very much. Um, all right, so the advanced search in all of these databases lets you um, narrow down your search. 
So remember those keywords we came up with earlier um, when we were talking about how to do research well? Well, this is where you might start using those words, putting those terms in and searching them as keywords. If it's a really important keyword, again, like um, you know, my research I said I wanted to do was on conspiracy theories. So I might wanna make sure that that word or phrase is actually in the title of any research so that I know this article is really about conspiracy theories or misinformation. Um, I can also search for a particular author's name, a university affiliation. Um, by using advanced search, it just lets me narrow my search and be a little more precise. You can also see here at the bottom of the screen, I can select a certain date. If I only want to see things that were written in the last six months, I can do that. If I want to see things that were written in the last five years, I can search that way. So that's the advantage of advanced search. But again, if, you, if you're not comfortable using advanced search, you can use that homepage just like you'd use a Google search, okay? Um, the last way you might want to start exploring these databases is by browsing by what we call discipline or topic. And that's what I'm gonna show you on this screen right here, okay? Um, I'm gonna use the example of, I want to do some research on social media marketing, okay? So rather than you know, starting with that either simple search or the advanced search, I've chosen to look, uh, browse by topic, okay? And you can see here that one of the topics is marketing. So by selecting the marketing um, topic, I can see all of these related terms that are related to marketing. So if I only wanted to, if I wanted to narrow my search to um, marketing to Generation X or millennials or international marketing, um, this is how I can do that by just selecting these um, subtopics under the topic marketing. So if you're just starting out, this is a really good way to start your research is by looking at these keywords because they can help you develop those, um, those search terms that you might want to use even when you're using Google or other resources, okay? Um, I have used the, okay, I'm going to let somebody else answer that question. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to an actual search that I did. Again, I decided I, was, I wanted to search on social media marketing. And so all I did was I typed that into the, the, the basic search box. And as you can see in academic one file, I have found over 2,400 academic journal articles over 5,000 magazine articles, 18 books, 26,000 news articles, three images and two videos. So all of those are available to me through Academic One File, okay? But let's face it, um, none of us actually want to page through 2,479 um, academic journal articles, right? Um, so probably we wanna start narrowing down um, our search. And so that's the next thing I want to show you. And that's here on the side. All right. See on the right hand side here, we've got this, these filter options. So we can fil filter by the, the particular um, publisher or the title of the journal. Um, we can say, I only want to see peer reviewed. I only want to see full text. I can, again, I can narrow down by the particular date. And as I add all these filters, slowly that 2,479 articles is going to become a more manageable list of titles. Okay. So again, really basic search but then you can start narrowing it down 
um, if you've got too many results, okay? And then my final screen here is, this is actually what a, um, a journal article is going to look like, okay? So you can see it's about 10,000 words in length. So that's a pretty decent sized report. You can see who wrote it, when they wrote it. You can also see what you can do with it. Okay, at that top, you can see that little site in red. So if you're doing academic research, you're gonna need to cite your resources um, at the end of your paper or in your presentation. So these databases will help you automatically ger um, generate a citation for every piece of work that you wanna cite in your, in your own research. You can listen to an audio um, version of the article if that was of interest. I, I don't think anybody wants to listen to a 10,000 word um, article about social media and um, advancing brand awareness and to increase online sales, but maybe you do. Um, but that's something else you can do is you can actually listen to all of these. Um, the other red box you'll see you can add this article to your Google folder. You can email it to yourself or colleagues. You can download a copy, you can print it. So there's lots of ways that then, you know, if you are doing research and you wanna come back to this later, you don't have to log back into eLibrary USA. You can be downloading these materials so you can use them later. Or like I say, emailing them to yourself, saving them to your Google Drive. Okay, um, so I know that that's a lot of information really fast um, and I will be happy to answer additional questions um, about these or if at some point you would like even more tutorials on how to do research using any of these, I would be happy to do a follow-up um, session. But for now, I wanna say thank you and ask if there are any additional questions. Um, I see, we'll check the registration form, okay. Just received the email. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of people are, um, have been able to get the, uh, the login credentials. Again, if you, um, you know, if you, they'll be in the slides that we're gonna send out afterwards. If you have friends, or colleagues that would like um, to have access to eLibrary USA, we're going to send the URL where they can um, just write in to um, request the login and password themselves. We do this so that we can communicate with everybody because at some point we are gonna have to probably take this service away. And so it just helps us to know how many people have requested logins um, so please do have them uh, fill out the form, if you will. So, all right, well, I'm glad some people are finding this helpful. And like I say, if, um, you know, if you ever want to learn more about this, I can, um, I can do a full class on just any one of these resources. There's a lot to learn. Um, anyway, I wanna make sure I'm getting all the questions. Please share the registration form with your friends. There we go. Um, can you have another presentation on how to write each part of a research report? I can certainly try. And if I can't do it, I'm sure we can find somebody who's even better at it than I am. So stay tuned. Um, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and we'll announce when we have um, more classes on research. Uh, read the email. If the AC is open for public, does that mean we have to go to AC to access eLibrary USA? So again, um, access from home is temporary. However, it's not going to be shut off as soon as our American Center reopens, because this is a worldwide service that we apply, that we offer at six hundred of our spaces worldwide. And so as long as a lot of the other American centers and American corners are still closed, 
this service is going to be available, okay? I can't tell you exactly when we're going to have to turn off the, the home access, all right? Um, any other questions? I got the account, glad to receive it. Glad you're all excited about this. All right. Um, all right, well, before I go, I'm studying master in Vietnamese university, but do we do not have instruction about citation? Can you recommend me a document about how to cite resources? Um, there are some really good resources. One of them is called Strunk and White. Um, it is a book and I'm sure it is online. And there is also another, a um, lot of the newspapers in the United States publish information on how to correctly cite information. And I wanna say it's the AP guide to citations or something similar to that. But again, the good thing is if you use um, the Gale database, the JSTOR, you will be able to create a citation automatically. Okay, um, so please do give that a try and it'll probably help you figure out how to, how to do citations well. All right, okay, before I let you all go, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about some of the other programs that we have coming up. Okay, and the first one I wanna mention is this Communication for Success series. Um, that will be, I believe, every Wednesday. Sorry, I can't quite see what's on the screen. Yes, from three to four Wednesdays. Uh, the next one I want to be sure you're aware of is we are doing a podcast competition. Um, we welcome anybody 14 to 35 years old to send us in a podcast. Um, Guidelines, um, you can find more about it online on our Facebook or Instagram. Um, the deadline is fast approaching on July 25th. Um, something else you might be interested in is our diplomacy simulations. Um, these are particularly good if you are interested in debate. Um, you get to learn about a international um, subject and I believe this one is going to actually be on a international health crisis, not COVID, but something similar and um, how different nations might want to address these issues. So if you're interested in diplomacy, consider signing up for our diplomacy simulations. And last but not least, we have a service right now that is um, our peer review, our personal statement peer review. We have a couple excellent undergraduate and graduate student interns from the US. And they are really good at writing and they are really good at editing and reviewing other people's statements. So if you've already written your statement and you want to have somebody who is a native English speaker um, review your statement or your um, cover letter or something similar to that, um, you can use this service. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And again, I just wanna say thank you for all of your time. Um, I know that that was a lot of me talking um, and hopefully next time we will have a more interactive se uh, session and I hope to get lots and lots of questions from you. All right, okay. Well, with that, I wanna say again, thank you to everyone for tuning in. I hope you get a lot of use out of eLibrary USA. And please do let us know about other topics, um, both academic or even fun topics that you would like us to cover in the future. Um, we're all going virtual right now, so it's a great time for us to be having these kinds of presentations. And as you can tell, I love to talk. So anyway, um, thank you everyone, and I hope to see you again soon.